This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Baglin. You've heard the commercial every week on this show. In fact, you'll hear it again in about 30 seconds. The Nature and Wildlife Fund. Most ads go in one ear and out the other, but the good ones will stick. They make you think. This week, like good biologists, we'll dissect the nature and wildlife spot, see what's in there. We'll go inside outdoors with Sonny Carr and Don Dot to chat about the natural pack shelter here on Kentucky Afield Radio. Kentucky's Nature and Wildlife Fund. You see it as a contribution option when you prepare your state tax return. But you also see it as songbirds and wildflowers. You can see it in clear, flowing streams. Sometimes it's so secluded you may never see it at all. But if you only see it on your PC as you prepare your taxes, that's good to you. Google it and see the difference this fund makes. Kentucky's Nature and Wildlife Fund. The Natural Tax Shelter. It's time to register for Kentucky's elk hunts. This is Tim Farmer. The Kentucky Fish and Wildlife website is elk central and the only place to enter this year's draw. Elk hunting in old Kentucky. Take it from me, there's nothing like it. 1,000 names will be drawn, and with the pick two option, you got to like your odds. The deadline is midnight, April 30th. The Kentucky Elk Draw. Enter at fw.ky.gov. Again, fw.ky.gov. It's Charlie Baglin on Kentucky Field Radio. You know, that magical day is fast approaching, April 15th. Now, between now and then, folks will be scrambling to file their income taxes. And with a little luck, they'll get a little back. Tax time may not have many people singing, but there is a way, at least, that it can end on a good note. Part of the Kentucky Individual Income Tax Form includes something called tax checkoffs. That's where you can voluntarily support any of four special funds, something that you and your tax dollars can both get behind. They are the Nature and Wildlife Fund, the Child Victims Trust Fund, Veterans Program Trust Fund, and Breast Cancer Research and Education. All are voluntary and all have worthwhile goals and objectives. We're here today, though, to talk about one of those checkoff options called the Nature and Wildlife Fund. Maybe you've heard it by its nickname, the Natural Tax Shelter. How much does it raise? Where's the money go? Who administers it? We'll find out this hour on Kentucky Field Radio. My guests are Sonny Carr, head of the Kentucky Wildlife Diversity Program, which is part of the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources, and the executive director of the State Nature Preserves Commission, Don Dutt. Well, thanks, Charlie. Good afternoon. It's tax season. We have a fund that's part of the Kentucky State Individual Income Tax Form that allows you to contribute to the Nature and Wildlife Fund. Who between the two of you can give a good definition of exactly what that fund's about? That fund was set up uh, some years back, and it's uh, divided between the Kentucky Nature Preserves Commission and the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources, and it's for acquisition of lands, natural lands that meet the uh, purposes of our two different agencies, as well as taking care of those lands once you acquire them. Sonny, if you're with wildlife diversity, does that mean more animals than plant life? Well, the way I would look at it um, is really the way I view our program Yes, we certainly can monitor and help enhance certain animal populations, but all of those depend on the plant populations. And I know we've discussed in prior programs, um, it's all about good quality habitat on the landscape, and the animals respond. So Don's habitat will help Sonny's animals. That's right. Tell me about the Nature Preserves Commission. Well, what we're looking at, uh, the purpose of the preserves is similar to the Wildlife Division of Fish and Wildlife is uh, protecting the biodiversity of Kentucky. So Fish and Wildlife started out with a focus on hunting and fishing game. And the Nature Preserves Commission is on all the diversity of Kentucky. So it includes all of those species, plants and animals both. So we try and find what's rare out there and keep them from becoming more rare, or keep them from going off the map so that we have more of those species and affect more options in our tool chest of what's out there for us to work with. I have heard you say in the past you are in place to protect the last remaining Great places. <laughs> Great places of Kentucky. And some of the areas that you have helped to save, you could walk into those today 
and it would look virtually like it did before Europeans set foot. Well, where are some of these? That's right. Uh, probably the best example of that would be Blanton Forest. It's the largest old growth forest in the state. It's over in Harlan County. And there's about 2,300 acres of old growth forest in there. So a forest that's never been timbered or logged. Uh, we also work on um, the diversity of all the habitats across Kentucky. And an area that we were working with Fish and Wildlife in the last few years was the prairie remnants and glades and barrens. And those are scattered in more open areas. And those have been more impacted by humans. So while we have some of those areas, we're in the process of restoring them as well. One of the big missing components is fire. Fire is off the landscape now. We've got to put that back in in a controlled way uh, so that we can restore habitats to what they were pre-European. A lot of times there's a tendency to think pre-Europeans there wasn't much human impact on the land, but there was because there was a, a large Native American population that fluctuated when the Europeans came in and some things occurred before that, but they had a large impact on the environment as well. The Nature and Wildlife Fund helps protect, conserve, preserve. What's your adjective of choice? Conserve, I think. And, Sonny, as far as the Nature and Wildlife Fund working with the Kentucky Wildlife Diversity Program, how does it help you get your job done? Well, a very important piece of our job is trying to keep our finger on the pulse of what is happening on the landscape with birds, with reptiles, amphibians, bats. Don brought up a good point and made me get to to think sometimes when we think about our precious natural areas, we think about things were better, perhaps in times past or different. And a great point is man still had an influence on the landscape, even pre-European settlement. And one thing our citizens need to realize today is we have areas across the state right now that are just as important and just as viable as they were in years past. And it's just as important to keep our eyes open and keep continuing our mission of acquiring good properties to help manage and preserve those for future generations, for families to enjoy, to understand their landscape. There are some disease issues affecting wildlife and even some plants like woolly adelgid, the hemlock, and white-nose syndrome with bats. Those are affecting our landscape today. And so we're witnessing some major changes on the landscape now. So those monies help us to keep abreast of what's going on and how we can maybe improve things and change them for the better. I think it's safe to say that for anybody who has never heard of the Kentucky Wildlife Diversity Program, it probably would go in one ear and out the other. But if you say peregrine falcons, if you said bald eagles, you were instrumental in helping get them off of the endangered species list, were you not? We were. We we were one state of many that had a concerted effort on restoring these birds and bringing them back and were successful in, in getting them off the uh, endangered species list and are doing great today. Last year, we had over 100 eagle nests across the state. The peregrine falcons are doing extremely well. It's amazing from when I started with the agency you know, in the mid-90s, the situations that we find ourselves working in with nesting birds today. Years past, it was like, oh, great, we're going to be hacking some birds or releasing them from some power plants. And now we're working with a bridge project, the bridge spanning into Madison, Indiana, where there's birds on a nest and they're putting a new bridge in. And we're trying to move boxes and move birds. And it's just it's really interesting. But they're doing great. They're um, taking advantage of places across Kentucky that they want to raise their families. And we've got a lot of great opportunities out there. You talk about Madison, Indiana. I grew up. 12 miles from there, and I have aunts, uncles, cousins in Madison. But you say on the bridge, on the structure itself, there's a nest with falcons on it? Yes, they have used that in years past. And uh, one of our biologists, Kate Hayden, has worked with Department of Transportation and also the construction company, and they have done an outstanding job working with us. You know, one thing you want to do is walk into a multi-million dollar project that's on a timeline and go, hey, guess what, everybody? You've got some peregrine falcons that like to hang out on your bridge, and you're usually not the welcome person in the room. But uh, by the end of the project, this has been going on now for nearly a couple years, and they have been absolutely wonderful. Once they realized all that the birds needed was a little bit of space in a box, basically under the bridge, they have been fantastic. They're accommodating us with getting the new box on the bridge, which is installed, and making sure that we can get access to go in so that we can ban the chicks and we can monitor the birds. You know, a lot of what we do, whether it's buying properties or monitoring and helping wildlife along the way, once our folks, our citizens, realize what they have, they fall in love with it. And that's one of our best untold stories with, I think, with Don's Nature Preserves and with our management areas and with our efforts. These tax checkoff dollars, 
They go to help things every single day that a lot of our citizens may not even realize they have available to them. We've got beautiful areas across the state. We've got some of the most diverse wildlife in the world, especially when it comes to the aquatics. And citizens in Kentucky should be really proud of what they have and what we can do with what they provide to us. We've got to get to a break. But when we come back talking about the Nature and Wildlife Fund, we will talk about how to actually fund it. There is a process. It's on your individual Kentucky income tax form. This is one of those conversations about taxes you'll actually like. Hang tight. We'll be back. My name's Charlie Baglin, and this is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Kentucky Afield Radio, and my name is Charlie Baglin. In the studio with me, Sonny Carr with the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife's Wildlife Diversity Program, and Don Dot, who heads the Kentucky State Nature Preserves Commission. And we're talking about the Nature and Wildlife Fund. You'll see this on your state tax return. If you're filling out your taxes, uh, you'll probably come across this on uh, Tax Form 740, I believe it is. And uh, it gives you the opportunity to invest a little bit of your refund that you'll be getting back toward a program that helps things such as wildlife and wildlife habitat. This is from Kentucky. This has nothing to do with federal. If I'm a taxpayer and I have a refund coming to me, at the very end of the form, it says, okay, you have the opportunity to contribute. If you so choose, you can give to the Nature and Wildlife Fund, the Child Victims Trust Fund, the Veterans Program Trust Fund, or Breast Cancer Research, and you can give what they have indicated there. You can check the box as $10, $25, or $50, or other, whatever it might be, a dollar or your entire refund. It doesn't doesn't matter. Give to one or all. How much does that fund collect every year? Well, we get thirty to 40000 out of it annually, but that's the half of the nature preserve, so you'd have to double that. So it'd be sixty to eighty is roughly where it's coming in. Sixty to eighty thousand dollars is what you get from the nature and wildlife fund every year. Is there something that you would suggest to people who have not done yet their taxes of what they might want to remember coming up when they sit down with uh, the computer to do it? Yeah, I would think that uh, when you sit down and do your taxes and you look at those, look those over, I think about some of the places you've been outdoors that you've enjoyed, maybe a wildlife management area or a nature preserve. If that's something you'd like to see more of, here's an easy way for you to contribute a few dollars to, or as like you said, your entire refund or just a dollar, whatever you want to do. But And you might look at it as, well, my little bit's not going to help, but it's not just your little bit. It's another little bit, another little bit, and that's how you get to sixty to 80000 and hopefully we can bump that up to some more. And the more that's there, the more we can accomplish with it and purchasing some of these lands for the public to get out and enjoy and, and protect the wildlife across the state. Tax preparation has changed over the years. Sonny, you'll remember we would sit down with paper forms. Not anymore. I guess you could still go to your tax preparer or you sit down to the computer and do it. Do you have a preferred way? I have a professional do mine. <laughs> I'll leave those in good hands. <laughs> tax Act, TurboTax, Today, you will see on commercials, on in the newspaper, if you look, Tax Preparer A guarantees you the maximum refund. We want to get you every benefit. We want to make sure you've taken advantage of every deduction out there known to man. And we want to get you the most refund back that we possibly can. Now, inherently, if I'm that tax preparer, I might gloss over these contributions. And besides, it gets you out of my office and the next customer in a little more quickly. You're right. Um, It's a very busy time of year for them. Um, A lot of the clients are more focused on is this relevant and this deduction and so on and so forth. And this may not cross their mind, but I think it is extremely important to just, you know, be bold. Tell your tax preparer, say, hey, you know, there's a box at the end of that. I want to make sure I check this year. And Don mentioned some good points earlier about um, the monies and, and how we can use them. But something that's really important to me is a lot of citizens may not realize that when they give that $15 or that $20, a lot of times we're able to match those dollars to some other funds. So it's like turning your $15 into $30 or sometimes 45 or even more. And that helps us. We can take your, it may seem like a little bit to you, but that means a whole lot out on the landscape and builds a lot of opportunities because we can match those to other programs that we have access to. So those dollars are extremely important. And also, I'm really honorary, and as much stuff as I feel like I pay for that I'm not too crazy about, well, by golly, I want to give some money into something I like, and I know land is long-term. They ain't making no more of it. I've made a note here. 
by giving to a tax checkoff, whatever that tax checkoff may be, is one way that you can uh, direct your tax dollars towards something you support, something you like that is near and dear to your heart. You take personal stock in. In my personal story, this was a few weeks ago. I was at my tax preparer's office, and I've known this lady for a long time, and she's competent, and she knows that I'm in the fish and wildlife and outdoor business, and I have a feeling that she would have said, would you like to contribute to this or, or, or any of them? But I told her right up front, if I am due a refund from Kentucky, don't forget, I would like to contribute to the Nature and Wildlife Fund. I got a refund and I contributed, but I reminded her. She may have reminded me. I don't know. I beat her to the punch. But that's something that would you suggest to people, hey, remember that this is on there and I would like to contribute. Absolutely. I think that's key, Charlie. Just on your drive in, look around you, think about something you enjoy seeing out there and what that reminds you when you get in the office to say, hey, I'd like to contribute. If you don't give while you're doing your taxes, are there any other opportunities? Can I write you a check? Can my estate write you a check? Yeah. Don, do you have- Sure. Actually, the uh, last mm-hmm. parcel that we just purchased over on Pine Mountain, um, it was included a bequest that was a gentleman left money to us through his will. And that was a big portion of that. And as Sonny was mentioned earlier, that these dollars that people make the donations through the tax checkoff get matched with other funds. We used four or five different funding sources. I'd have to go back and check now to buy that parcel of land. So There is one way that I wish you could contribute to this fund, but as I understand it, you cannot. Let me tell the story. For the past two years, I have owed the state of Kentucky money, and so my tax preparer told me that I cannot incur further liability by adding to what I already owe by contributing to a fund. So, for the last couple of years, you two have missed out on my contribution. (laughs) You can make up for that this year. That's right. But you can if, if someone wanted to contribute to this. Is it as simple as putting a check in the mail, or do you need to contact the two of you and say, I've got a project I want to help support, or what are you doing that how, how can I help because I want to contribute? You can send a check payable to the Kentucky State Treasurer and just include a statement with it saying, I want this to go to the Nature and Wildlife Fund, and we'll make sure it gets deposited to that account. Um, we can also, the Nature Reserves Commission, we get occasionally people send in donations any time of the year. They might send us a check for 25 or 50 or $100 or whatever, and we can deposit that into an account. And if they want that to go for land acquisition, then we put it into a land acquisition account, and that's all that gets used on. And I'm sure Fish and Wildlife has the same setup. We do. We get in the situation we're in, Charlie mentioned earlier, the falcons and and eagles. um, Those are very charismatic. And a lot of those we end up with some type of corporate or industrial partners many times because of where the birds like to nest and, and where we do observations. And we have a lot of the power companies, our supporters, and they find out what we're, what we're doing and they understand why. And we consistently get in monies from those. We also get the same thing, monies from individuals that understand what we're doing and, and why. And so they also, um, a lot of times they'll send a, a check into the department along with the note saying what their wishes are. And, and we, you know, we like to adhere to that and we appreciate their support. Given that there are so many different tax software programs in use today, there may be some to where you can Skip this section if you so choose, or sometimes these tax checkoffs may be a must-populate field. I want to opt out of this, or yes, I want to do it, and here's the amount. Uh, One of the things that we've been looking at trying to do but hasn't worked out yet is with some of these commercial companies that do those tax returns, the tax checkoff is at the end of the form, right before you sign it. You, you know, the little boxes are there that you can check off. And what we would like to do is to get a, um, if it's on an online system where then you could click on Nature and Wildlife Fund and it would take you to some of the properties that have been acquired so you can see actually where your money has gone and give people a good example and, and make a little more connection with it than just a couple of words on a piece of paper. We haven't been able to put that into place yet. We're still looking at that, but uh, I think that would be um, an interesting thing to do. Talking about the Nature and Wildlife Fund, which is a tax checkoff if you're a Kentucky citizen and you pay taxes and fill out a Kentucky personal income tax form, you will come across this toward the end of your tax preparation, be that on your PC 
or at your tax preparer's office, the subject should come up, hey, there are four different tax checkoffs here. You can contribute to one or all, as much or as little as you would like, from your tax refund. And the Nature and Wildlife Fund is what we're talking about. I know one thing. People love to hear what their money has purchased. They want to know what their contribution has done to make a difference. We have two major acquisitions that are close to urban areas that I think people should really start to key in on Otter Creek. And that outdoor experience is now available. And we've gone and we've looked at it for bats and a few different things. But also Veterans Memorial. I'm thinking, you know, because you mentioned Pine Mountain. That's a really significant Uh one within the last year. Since we've got a lot of users coming back into Otter Creek, that's hitting Louisville and that Radcliffe area. You know, have you or one of your family members been able to go out and enjoy um, the Otter Creek outdoor recreation area since it's opened up or the newly acquired Veterans Memorial Park? We've got several properties that are jointly owned and managed with uh, nature preserves and Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources, and uh, one I can think of is the Wild Rivers Program over at Martin's Fork. We have nature preserves that are on some of the state parks, so you mentioned parks, and there's overlap there as well. The public probably sees conservation going on, and they don't draw the distinctions between the different agencies, I'm sure, and there are different focuses between the different agencies, but it very much all dovetails together, and we do cross paths a lot. When we come back after the break, I want to ask you two about success stories, but because I, I know that the benefits of this fund has to hit home for a lot of people, and we'll talk about some of these areas and some of these creatures uh, that live around the state when we come back. My name is Charlie Baglin, and you are listening to Kentucky A Field Radio. This is Kentucky A Field Radio. I'm your host, Charlie Baglin, Easter weekend. Let me tell you about the Kentucky A Field newsletter. Every week, usually on Thursday or Friday, We send out a newsletter on what's coming up on the coming weekend shows. It's an email, one email that actually covers two shows, Kentucky Afield TV and Kentucky Afield Radio. Tells you where Tim Farmer and crew are heading that weekend that you can watch on KET and a heads up on that weekend's Kentucky Afield Radio show. It's about a paragraph on each and a few links. We give you the link where you can watch a preview of the TV show and a link for the radio show in case you want to hear it again or share it with somebody. Put it on your Facebook page. What else? Kentucky Field Newsletter. You can opt out at any time. Sign up. All we need is your email address. And here's where you can find the link. KYAfield.com. KYAfield.com. Lower right-hand side of the page, you will see an icon with Tim Farmer's face on it. Click there, and that'll get you signed up. Kentucky Field Newsletter, the newsletter that lets you know first. It is fishing report time. Hi, everybody. This is Fred House with the Northeast Fishing Report. Our annual muskie sampling on Cave Run Lake began last week, and of the areas we sampled, fair numbers of muskie equal to or greater than 36 inches were collected. The lake level is around two feet below summer pool right now. That said, muskie, however, are being caught by anglers short trolling with shad colored baits or by casting red and white rattle traps. Some good places for bank anglers to fish for muskie on Cave Run Lake include across the dam face, Stony Cove, Scotch Creek Boat Ramp, both sides of where Route 1274 crosses Beaver Creek above Longbow Marina, and those culverts under Route 801 in Ramey's Creek and under Route 519 near Pot and Rock Boat Ramp, as well as the culvert under Route 1274 near Longbow Marina. Good luck and stay safe. Hi, this is John Williams with a fish report for Southeast Kentucky. The walleye should be finishing spawning here in the next few weeks, but those fish will stay shallow and can be caught on uh, Lake Carmel and Laurel Lake, especially at night, using suspending jerk baits like a husky jerk or rattling rogue or even shallow running jointed crank baits. So give that a try. That should be good through April. Also, in the district, we've stocked uh, trout in several of our streams, including our Fins Lake over in Knox County, the Brickyard Ponds, stocking 2,500 here in the next uh, few days. Uh, that should be good action for uh, family fishing, so give that a try. And also, I've heard good reports on smallmouth being caught on uh, Lake Cumberland and Laurel. 
primarily on jigs and shallow crankbaits and also on jerk baits. And as always, good luck and good fishing. This is Rob Rold in the Northwestern Fishery District. At No Lynn, crappie and white bass have both been active. Crappie are most active from the Wax area up to around Cane Run. Fish for the crappie around the main channel, brush piles, log jams, as well as back up into the embayment there at Cane Run Creek. Lake Malone, slow seems to be the name of the game. Jerk baits, as well as lipless crankbaits fished deep, have been picking up a few hits from some nice bass. The key is to fish them very slow with long pauses. Trout were stocked last week at our Finns Lakes, as well as Sandy Watkins Park in Henderson County and Morton's Lake on our Higginson Henry WMA in Union County. This week we will have trout stocked at the Tailwater in Lake Malone, as well as in Otter Creek Park in the Fort Knox area. Please remember, be safe on the water. Always wear your life jacket. Tax Refund Two very lovely words, especially when connected to the Nature and Wildlife Fund. More after the break. It's time to register for Kentucky's elk hunts. This is Tim Farmer. The Kentucky Fish and Wildlife website is elk central and the only place to enter this year's draw. Elk hunting in old Kentucky. Take it from me, there's nothing like it. 1,000 names will be drawn, and with the pick two option, you got to like your odds. The deadline is midnight, April 30th. The Kentucky Elk Draw. Enter at fw.ky.gov. Again, fw.ky.gov. At the absolute worst, it was a little white lie. A little white lie. After all, when it hit the line, it felt like a 15-pounder. It doesn't matter what the scale says. So it might be an ever-so-slight deviation from the truth. Sometimes in fishing, the truth is hard to catch. Maybe just a stretch. But the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife reminds you, fishing isn't about math. It's about fun. And fudging a little if you need to. Kentucky Fishing. It'll make a liar out of you. You're listening to Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Bagman, talking to Don Dot with Kentucky's Nature Preserves Commission and wildlife biologist Sonny Carr, who heads the Wildlife Diversity Program. Don and Sonny, I want to talk about some of the success stories that this fund has contributed to. Probably one of the most familiar to our public would be bald eagles. And as a lot of folks may remember, back in the early to mid-90s, uh, there was a lot of publicity and a lot of efforts begun by the Department of Fish and Wildlife to work on bald eagle restoration. And it had actually been going on for a number of years since DDT had been banned, which was the culprit for the, the demise of the eagles. Once that DDT was, in effect, out of the system, out of the food chain, then numbers slowly started to increase, and agencies were tasked with ensuring that there was ample protection and that there was nesting opportunities available wherever these birds might decide to to raise their families. And so that has been extremely successful. Again, when I started with the agency in the mid-'90s, there were fewer than 20 nests across the state, and last year we had a banner year with um, over 100 nests. And those are anywhere from Gist Creek to Cave Run to, you know, the far reaches of the Mississippi and Ohio rivers to eastern Kentucky on some of the larger waterways, Dale Hollow, central Kentucky, anywhere that you find large bodies of water, those traditionally were where people were seeing the birds first, whether flying over, feeding, or nesting. And now the numbers are doing very well, so the birds are going into smaller streams. A great example is Eagle Creek. Um, we have a, a bird up in Henry County, and uh, we have a pair up there and that we know that are using the area. And it's really exciting for our citizens to go out and see a bald eagle, especially at tax time. You think of <laughs> the eagles, our national symbol. And, and another one that Don and I have discussed a little bit is a project that we had going on at Shaker Village and uh, down in Mercer County. Um, that was actually begun as a large-scale habitat project with the intention of improving conditions for migratory songbirds and also quail. They have been a tremendous partner, the Shaker Village group has. We have been able to convert and restore many acres of native warm season grasses and prairie habitat there, and also some shrubland habitat that was common. And that area lies along the Kentucky River, and all of this great corridor ties into the Palisades region, and there's a lot of work being done along the Kentucky. With the work at Shakertown, the money's such that folks are going to contribute or can contribute to the tax checkoff fund, help support some research that we're doing. 
Anytime that we go into an area and we try to make some changes to the plant communities, we want to know how these birds are going to respond or how other wildlife is going to respond. If you are a, a citizen and you have the luxury of going down south to Florida every year with your family to spend the winter, and you get everybody together, you pack your bags, you get in the car and you go south and you go to your destination and you pull up to the drive and the house is gone. You're like, huh, I wish I would have known that before we came here. That's a bummer. (laughs) When we deal with migratory birds, we get a lot of the same thing. These birds are spending their winters oftentimes in Central and South America and they're choosing to come up here. Uh, Kentucky is home to over 200 different species of birds that nest here in the summertime. So that's a lot of different types of habitat. And that's a lot of change on the landscape. And so we try to monitor that and we try to manage habitat, plant populations, uh, to make it best suited for them. Sonny, your portion of this fund deals with animals. You mentioned bobwhite quail, a game species. That's right. But your wildlife diversity is about anything that you don't hunt and you don't fish. Do you have a clue or a percentage of the animals out there, what percentage of those are under your umbrella? Just a rough percentage, 95% of the wildlife in the state would fall under our shop. And it's lots of times it's things that people have never heard of, have never seen, or don't even know that we have. There's no bear, there's no deer, no rabbits, no elk, no waterfowl, no ducks. You're everything else. You are the bats, songbirds, salamanders, frogs. Mussels, yeah. Uh, My hat's off to you. That is not a small job. No, it's not. And, and Charlie, this time of year, folks are really frenzied. There's a lot going on. But everything that you mentioned is significant. All of those little quiet critters out there on the landscape all perform their own individual unique function. And they all play a part in the big picture. And a lot of our citizens are familiar with a lot of our game species, the bear, the elk, the deer, and our small game, squirrels, rabbits, quail, things of that nature. And, And they're important, too. And it's wonderful that they have a love and a vested interest in those. But work that we do for the species in my shop, it can benefit all of those, whether it's creating uh, pools of water for frogs and salamanders to lay eggs in and let those develop. Every turkey honey you know is going to want to set up a blind 20 yards from it. So there's a lot of overlap. And um, I don't see it as as an exclusion of of game versus, quote, non-game. To me, it's one landscape. And our job as professionals is to keep that in the best shape possible for the best diversity and health of our animal populations. Don, where Sonny works with animals, you work with land. And I know that there are some crown jewels in the state nature preserve system. Where are some of these that folks may have heard of, seen, visited? Sonny was talking about the Kentucky River Palisades. Over in that area, there are two that come to mind right off hand. There's three, actually. There's the... Tom Dorman State Nature Preserve, which is in the Palisades. And uh, it's on both sides of the river in Garrett and Jessamine counties, and that has a trail system that's open to the public. And there is Flora Cliff, which is in southeastern Fayette County, which is a real beautiful area that was properties originally acquired by biology professor Mary Wharton at Georgetown University and later became a state nature preserve. And a very interesting place is Lower Howard's Creek in Clark County that combines cultural with biological interest as well. It was an area, the the short version of the story is when the uh, settlers moved out of Boonesboro and started selling other parts. This was one of the first industrial areas back then. It was industry driven by water mills. And they built the water mills in this area because it had a nice um, cascading stream where you had, you know, changes in elevation so you can run the mills. And then when that technology was displaced by the steam engine, people began moving out of there. So you go in there now and you can see remnants of the old mills and the uh, mill races, but they're large trees. It's very heavily forested. There's beautiful wildfire displays in the spring. And there's a group called the Friends of Lower Howard's Creek that operate that area over there and and, uh, provide uh, guided tours through there. So those are some that are kind of crown jewels that are close into the population centers. How many nature preserves are there across the state? Uh, As of March, we will have 61 because we're adding a new one in March. One of the goals that we have for the Nature Preserve System is to get an example of the different natural communities in Kentucky, or ecological communities, and that's if you think of different types of forests, different types of swamps, prairies, glades. Uh, The ecologists break those out into, uh, depending on which one you talk to, 61 or 62 natural communities. And we have representative examples of 22 of those so far in our nature preserve system. So it's everything from uh, the lush mountains over in eastern Kentucky on Pine Mountain to the bottomland hardwood swamps over in 
western Kentucky. Uh, one that uh, Fish and Wildlife has is Laterno Woods, which is an old growth forest over there in the western part of the state. And they're very different. Uh, they're great to compare and, and visit the two and see the differences between them. It's safe to say that in these areas all across the state, when you get there, it's not like there's going to be a, a restaurant and a hotel waiting. These are wilderness areas. Somewhere in your system, I've heard you say you have unique species that are known to exist nowhere other than in this one spot in Kentucky. What's that story? That's right, Charlie. That's uh, what's called an endemic species, something that's known from a particular locale. Now, an endemic could be statewide, and it's only known from Kentucky, or we have one over in the uh, Louisville area called Kentucky Gladecrest. It's only known from southern Jefferson and northern Bullock counties. It's a small flowering plant, but that's the only place in the world where it's known to grow. So we work at trying to protect that with um, some of the developers over there in subdivisions that maybe they can set aside an area where this plant grows and uh, protect that. When we purchase these properties, quite often there's restoration that needs to be done to get the habitat back. And then you have to get a parking area built, and then you got to get a trail system built in. So it takes a little while to do that, but we like to have all of them open to the public and do as many as that we can. Someone on your staff told me once upon a time, what's wrong with the greenery in this scenery? Have either of you heard that? It's cute. Unfortunately, I have, yes. It's cute. But what's wrong with the greenery and the scenery? And the point that Joyce Bender was making was people like me might look out across the countryside and see trees and plants growing to the kingdom come. But there are some plants in there that shouldn't be there. And she has an eye for that. You two have an eye for that, but maybe the general public not so much. I have a feeling that part of what the Nature and Wildlife Fund helps to eliminate are some of these invasive species, things that are there that shouldn't be. Comment to either one of you. The greenery that a lot of people don't recognize is the greenery that doesn't belong there. It's things like a Japanese honeysuckle, and it's so pervasive and it grows in so many places that it just appears to be a natural part of the landscape, but it's really not. Um, another one is bush honeysuckle, and Lexington's made a concerted effort over there to reduce some of those populations. Uh, the, the bush honeysuckle will overtake the understory in a forest and crowd out and shade out the other plants that would grow there that are native species. It doesn't have the predators or the diseases that it would face in its homeland aren't here to keep it in check, and it just grows out of control. Kudzu is the most, that's the poster child for invasive species. But there are a one. lot of others, yeah, that are trying to catch up with kudzu, unfortunately. And we hope that it never does, because kudzu will just drape over a forest just as if it were a curtain. When we come back, we've got to go to our break. I'm going to ask you, what would each of you do if money grew on trees and this fund was was limitless? We'll talk more about the Nature and Wildlife Fund coming up on Kentucky Field Radio. You're listening to Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Bagman. Talking about the Nature and Wildlife Fund, which is a tax checkoff if you're a Kentucky citizen and you pay taxes and fill out a Kentucky personal income tax form, you will come across this toward the end of your tax preparation, be that on your PC or at your tax preparer's office. Yeah, the subject of black holes can certainly come up when we talk about anything. I give my money, but where does it go? Yeah, there is skepticism out there today when it comes to giving, and I would think rightfully so. Where does this money go? Does it do any good? I know one thing. People love to hear what their money has purchased. They want to know what their contribution has done to make a difference. And that's what we've been talking about with nature preserves, the benefit of bald eagles and peregrine falcons and songbirds. Let me be the one to say thank you, too, for what you have done. I'm glad I know where my contribution has gone. But if you had a million dollars, what would you do with it? Oh, that would be a great opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think the the first goal is probably purchasing more land. Um, you know, they're not making any more land. A lot of the land is getting developed, and so the areas where there are is good, high quality habitat is still out there is becoming uh, more and more unfrequent. And so, trying to find those places and acquire them, if there's a willing seller and we can acquire them and protect them and conserve them for the future, I think that's one of the best things we can do. Kentucky, when you compare us to the uh, seven surrounding states, we have the least amount of state-owned land. 
And so I think if we can increase that, it's a quality of life issue to some extent where people can get out and have these places and visit, or just knowing they're there sometimes is a benefit as well. So I think if we had an unlimited roll-in of funds to the Nature and Wildlife Fund, land acquisitions would be the first criteria. And, of course, you have to take care of these lands. As we've talked earlier, there's restoration work that needs to be done, parking lots that need to go in. That's maybe not the sort of thing that sounds real sexy, but if you want to get out there and visit them and see them, that's what part of what we got to do, too. So there is a big stewardship responsibility of taking care of these properties, and uh, those are the two main criteria, I think. Sonny, you asked me a question. Charlie, if behind your house, what would you rather see, a shopping center or a mature forest? Yes, Charlie, behind your house, would you rather see a shopping center or a mature forest? I would rather see a mature forest times 10. I don't know who wouldn't. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't 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 sure. everyone? Yeah. But you know, maybe not. Maybe not everyone. That's not fair. But I have a feeling that people love the outdoors if they know it or not. You know, that's a really good point, Charlie. When when we're talking about what would we do with this money, our society is changing. We have increasing population numbers. It's putting pressure on the landscape in terms of development and just like Don mentioned, it's getting more difficult to find some of those special places to conserve them and, and to manage them. If I had a million dollars, absolutely, a land acquisition is, is critical. I would also strive to not only buy the best, but buy those best remnants that I know that we could put some investment in and bring those back to make it a meaningful, healthy place. But honestly, I, I just think it would be great if somehow we could really open the door, provide an opportunity, maybe make like a go visit somewhere new weekend or some special something just to encourage folks to go out and see what's out there. Because I guarantee you, we've got thousands upon thousands of citizens in our state that probably haven't even been to a forest, whether it's the Daniel Boone or Laterno Woods or Blanton Forest or anything. But just to encourage them to go outside to see what they're missing because maybe their viewscape has been a shopping center and they don't know what it feels like to be able to stand in a forest and close your eyes and just to smell it and to hear the sounds and to realize how enriching that is in their life. I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize we're so focused on moving ahead that sometimes we don't stop to appreciate what we have. And I would love for somehow, whether it's <laughs> taking a busload of kids out and sending them in the woods and let them listen or something, but just so that they understand this is an important part of their life. Maybe they touch it every day, maybe they don't, but it's there for them. You have kids. Yeah, I do. <laughs> you're, you're talking about not just kids. Everywhere. You're talking about your kids. My kids are outside all the time. Yeah. Yeah, my kids are the ones that still play with sticks and rocks. But you see that benefit. <laughs> I do. It, and I'm telling you, it makes a tremendous amount of difference, and not just in young people. But we have family and friends, adults, that live in town. They come out and they just look around. They're like, this is just so wonderful. They feel freedom that they don't always feel when they're in town. And My kids play in the creek all the time. I have friends that say, can I please bring my children over so they can play in your creek? And I say, yes, bring some garbage bags and the worst clothes they own. And there is a joy when those kids are outside playing that you don't see on a playground. It's different, and I don't know how to describe it, but it's real. The Nature and Wildlife Fund, it's on your Kentucky Personal Income Tax Forum. We've talked about it now for close to an hour. Don, any last comments on encouraging people to at least take a look at this, to Google it, to see what the Nature and Wildlife Fund is about, and maybe they'd want to give uh, 10 bucks or that million I was talking about. Uh, I think if you want to see where your funds have been spent, then go to the websites. If you've got the computer access and look at Kentucky Fish and Wildlife, the wildlife management areas, and you can go to the Nature Preserves Commission and look at our nature preserves. And we have information on there about all those sites, and so you can check them out. And if you like what you see, help us do some more. It would be great. Let's throw out a couple of websites. Sonny, you're at fw.ky.gov. And yours is similar. Is it Nature Preserves? Right, naturepreserves.ky.gov. And you can find out all you need to know about both of your shops right there. Last question. Do either one of you text and drive? Well, of course not. That would be wrong, Charlie. <laughs> no, I'm one-handed. <laughs> well, thanks to the both of you for coming in. We have done it justice and then some. Hey, if there is a Kentucky Field radio show that you have missed or you would like to hear again or post to your Facebook page, they are out there. MyHuntingAndFishing.com MyHuntingAndFishing.com That's a good place to start. 
We update weekly also on iTunes and on YouTube. In the search box, type in Kentucky Field Radio. You'll find our channel, and you can watch and listen to you turn blue. It's Easter weekend. My mama would always give me chocolate-covered marshmallow rabbits for Easter. I wish those days weren't gone. I had a special report about Easter. I wanted to squeeze in, but time got away from us. And it's all about a wildlife look at why we have come to accept a rabbit. A rabbit? A rabbit. <laughs> a rabbit. A rabbit as the symbol of Easter. But I do have it available as a bonus on our YouTube channel. It's well done. Find it. It's about five minutes long. Again, search Kentucky Field Radio and it will pop up. It is spring. And the best time of the year is here. Next week, wild turkey season. So come back and we will go inside outdoors again. I'm Charlie Baglin. Join us here on Kentucky Field Radio.